testing. Hi, guys. Hello. Do I have your attention for a second? Hi, my name is Andy, and I'm here to talk to you guys about a club I'm part of called Armor. The club is mainly devoted towards raising awareness about ant about antimicrobial resistance. Who here has heard of antimicrobial resistance or AMR? Just a show of hands. Okay, so a good fair amount of you. For those that don't know, antimicrobial resistance can spawn when bacteria are exposed to antibiotics, and as a result, the bacteria can become resistant to said antibiotics. And as a result, it can lead to what some describe as superbugs. And superbugs are a very serious thing because they can turn seemingly minor things like just a cut or a scrape into a very serious injury. And, it can, and it's very relevant to the modern day. So it's a very pressing issue. Um, some things our club is doing right now to fight the issue is we're working on getting the campus to swap out its soap because the one it's using right now is completely loaded with antibiotics for a new one. And another thing we're doing is we're trying to put together a soap drive, like a make your own type of soap drive. And yeah, if you're interested, um, other members of my club weren't able to make it today because one's car broke down. So she's going to be here about 15 minutes later with flyers about the club. But if you're interested, you can visit our website at uh, just search to you Boulder Armor, and thank you. So I'm going to get started. Um, so announcements for today are that Sapling Chapter 1 is now open. Hopefully those of you who are on Sapling um, have seen that. I think we're still missing um, a bunch of people from the class who haven't signed up yet. So if this is you, um, please make sure you get on that because um, Sapling Chapter 1 is going to be due one week after I finish the chapter, um, which I have tentatively set for Friday next week as the due date at 9 AM. Um, I may adjust that depending on how far we get today. I'm actually thinking I might skip the last bit of material out of chapter one, um, molecular orbitals, because um, Loudon doesn't actually cover it yet. And I may sort of stick that back in later on. But I'm sort of still on the fence about that. So for the time being, um, sapling chapter one is due next Friday at 9 AM. I'll update that if it changes. OK. Um, and then recitations start next week. So we had the first couple of weeks off, but make sure you go Monday or Tuesday next week. OK. Um, any questions about those? Yeah? Are there any materials that we can bring No. Um, you can bring your textbook. That might be helpful. But really, it's just sort of, um, I guess, chapter notes, if you've got them, or like whatever notes you're taking from lecture might be helpful, too. Mm -hmm. OK. So um, where we get up through last time is we're still in chapter one. We're sort of reviewing some um, gen chem topics that are going to be very helpful moving forward. Um, so what we're getting into now for the rest of this chapter is orbital theory. So we're going to start out kind of small and build our way up into more complicated orbitals. OK. So when I drew that really basic depiction of, a uh, of an atom um, a few lectures back, I drew like the nucleus with the electrons going around it. Um, that's not really that accurate a representation of how atoms actually work. Um, we show them like in a simpler model as defined particles with a discrete location. But really, they're small enough that we don't actually have that much information about exactly where they are all the time. Um, so 
electrons um, are small enough that they have a lot of wave-like behavior. OK, um, wave-like properties or wave-like character. So rather than showing like a really solid particle orbiting around the nucleus, what's actually more accurate is to show um, sort of a probability wave centered around the nucleus. Um, so we're going to use atomic orbitals, or AOs, to show the location of this wave, or in other words, the area where the electron's likely to be. Okay, so, um, I guess sort of a disclaimer for this whole section, a lot of this might seem kind of hand wavy and like we're just sort of making up rules for the heck of it. Um, a lot of this makes a ton of sense if you decide to go on and take PCHEM at some point in the future, you'll actually go through like the three dimensional calculus of generating these orbitals and like using the math to show the exact shape of where they're located in space. For now, we're just sort of like pulling the basic rules that PCHEM derives and sort of using them for OCHEM purposes but we're only going to dig down into a fairly shallow level of theory here, just as much as we need to be able to apply it for useful outcomes. Okay, so pretty much for now, just go with it, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so the atomic orbitals, the AOs that we're gonna use, are based on three quantum numbers. So the first of these is the principal quantum number, or lowercase n, which I'm going to draw like a little bit fancy looking so that it is recognizable as an n. Um, so this one is sort of the most important one to describe the shape of the orbital, and this sets um, both the size and the energy of orbital, of the orbital. Okay, so the permissible or the possible values that n can be are just counting numbers, so one, two, three, four, so on. Okay, so one and up. Uh, integers. Okay, so the bigger numbers means both a bigger orbital um, which also means that it's higher energy. Okay which makes sense because if we're looking at a bigger orbital, a bigger um, sort of wave area around the nucleus, that means that on average, if the electron's somewhere in that area, it's going to be on average further out from the nucleus in a bigger, bigger orbital than it would be in a smaller orbital. And we know that the nucleus is plus, the electron's minus charged, and so splitting those apart from each other further probably takes, <laughs> probably takes more energy. Okay. Um, so let me get through all three of these and then we can go through some examples. Okay, um, so next up is the angular momentum number. So the angular momentum quantum number is lowercase l, which again I'm going to do in cursive so that it's recognizable as an L, um, which tells you the shape of the orbital. Uh, 
Okay. So allowable values here um, can range from zero to n minus one, whatever the n is for that particular orbital. So like if n is three, you can have zero, one, or two as permissible values for L, for example. Okay. And so different values of L set different shapes of the orbital. So if L is zero, um, then the orbital is an S orbital, which is shaped like a sphere. It's a spherical orbital. So we would call that an S orbital. Um, if L is one, then the atomic orbital is dumbbell shaped. Yep, exactly. And that's a P orbital. And then, so these two are by far the most common ones we're going to see in OCHEM because it turns out that we pretty much only end up using S and P orbitals most of the time. But I mentioned that atoms that can violate the octet rule because they're low enough down in the periodic table do that by using their d orbitals. Um, if L is 2, the atomic orbital um, actually has a couple different solutions to the equations that you end up generating. Um, it can be clover leaf shaped, I guess like a four leaf kind of clover. Or it can be this sort of dumbbell with a donut around the middle. Um, both of those are examples of d orbitals. Okay, so most of what we're going to be looking at uses s and p orbitals, but d's do sometimes show up a little bit. Um, if L is 3, then we're looking way down at the lanthanides and actinides, and that's pretty much irrelevant for OCHEM. Um, there's a ton of different shapes those can be, though. Okay. Cool. So the third one is going to be the magnetic quantum number. Or M sub L. Um, and that just tells you the orientation of the orbital. Okay, so this is allowed to be anywhere in the range from negative L to positive L. So if L is zero, M sub L can only be zero. If L is 1, M sub L can be negative 1, 0, or 1. We'll go through examples of how these look. Um, OK, so partly this describes what direction the orbital is pointing. Um, but it also, as it turns out, determines how many orbitals of a given set of other values can exist. So for a given uh, n and l value. OK, so let's work through some examples here of how these might be used. So say we're generating an orbital. And we're going to just sort of randomly pick n equals 2. Um, at that point, we can pick any value for L that's 0 to n minus 1, so we can pick either 0 or 1. Um, I'm going to just randomly pick L equals 0. Okay, so this means that what permissible values do I have for M sub L? Is it just 0, right? Yeah.
OK, so the way we're going to call this orbital is it's an s orbital. We know that because l equals 0. And it's at the 2 energy level. This is called a 2s orbital. And it's shaped like a sphere around the nucleus. OK, um, another example, if we do n equals 2, and this time we pick maybe L could be the other acceptable value, acceptable value there. Let's do L equals 1. Um, at this point, M sub L could be any one of three different values. It could be minus 1, 0, or 1. So we're actually going to get three different options out of that. So all of these orbitals are, if we're following this pattern, what would we call the ones with these two numbers? 2p, right? Because they're L sub 1, which makes them a p orbital, and they're at the 2 energy level. So we've got 2p orbital with three different options for m sub L. OK. so. I guess I didn't draw the 2s orbital, but let's do that down here. 2s is just going to be a sphere centered on the nucleus. Um, it has a little bit of internal structure. We'll get to that in a second. But the 2p orbitals, um, we know that m sub l sets the orientation of them. And that's actually going to be like the three different axes that they can lie along. So one option is sort of a dumbbell pointing upwards. So a 2p with m sub l equals negative 1. Um, or we could do a dumbbell pointing left and right. And we'll get into this in a little bit. But note that one of these halves of the dumbbell is a different color than the other half. Um, for now, don't worry about that too much. Um, so this is a 2p orbital again. But m sub l is going to be a different number. Maybe let's say 0. Um, the third one is kind of harder to draw. It's a 2p orbital that's lying along the axis pointing forward and back. So I'm going to show that as sort of two spheres where one's almost eclipsing the other. And that's also going to be a 2p, but with m sub l equals plus 1. OK, so these. Um, basically, they're pointing along the x or the y or the z axis in three dimensions. And so we're just going to sort of tack on 2px, 2py, and 2pz um, if we want to get really specific about it. But all three of them are just 2p orbitals. <coughs> if we lump them together. OK. Um, in the absence of external factors, like a magnetic field, it doesn't matter super much which one you call x, y, or z. Um, there is a convention, and I honestly don't remember which way it is, so I'm just going to throw some labels on there. Um, question? Mm -hmm. So the, the ML values, do you know that if it's up, it's negative 1, if it's, is that known? Um, well, I guess like it also depends on like your perspective on the thing. So really, it doesn't matter too much. Just throw one of the labels on there. Yeah. So um, and we're not even going to really bother differentiating between the three different two p orbitals either. So I'm just sort of doing this for like maybe this one corresponds to this, but I don't really know for sure that it matters. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Um, so other questions about this. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to move on to the other part of the board. All right, so I'm going to take a moment and erase uh, this lower part just so it's clearer to read if you guys want to take a minute.
Okay. So let's dig a little bit more into what's actually like making these orbitals um, or how to think of them. So um, there's kind of a bunch of math behind them, but from our sort of perspective, we can more or less think of them as sort of standing waves of probability. Um, so these atomic orbitals, or AOs in general, are standing waves. So when I say standing waves, I mean like if you see waves on the ocean, they're sort of traveling along. Um, but if you, say, pluck a guitar string, it always sort of vibrates with like the amplitude being in the same places along the string. So standing waves are waves that don't travel. Um, to cut out most of the physics behind that. Um, okay, so so these are sort of standing waves of the probability function that describes the electrons, um, which means they have crests, like high points, and troughs, or low points. So, in other words, um, again using like the guitar string kind of analogy, if you plug a guitar string, you'll see that it's sort of doing this thing, like maybe it's anchored here and here, not to that extent, but sort of um, zoomed in a bunch. Um, and it turns out that there's places where it goes through like a peak value, and places where it goes through a minimum value. And there are also places where it doesn't move at all. And those are called nodes. And if you plug the string, you'll notice that the nodes are kind of at set locations. So in this case, if I have um, one, two, three, four, five different nodes along that string, um, it's going to have like a certain number of waves in between uh, the two ends of the string. Okay. So, um, it turns out that this is sort of like a really flat, one-dimensional, um, along a line kind of analogy to what's happening in three-dimensional space, but it sort of does have some useful similarities that we can use to understand what's going on. Um, okay, so, Pretty much like at every point along this one dimensional line, we can use a number to describe like is the wave positive or neutral, like zero, or is it negative? And the same thing is kind of what's happening over here at every point in three dimensional space um, around the nucleus. We can use a, something to describe like is the value of the function there positive or negative? Um, So at every point in space around the nucleus, um, this wave, um, its value can be positive or negative or zero. Okay, so note that just because the value of the wave sort of amplitude, or the wave value um, is positive or negative doesn't change the charge on the electron. Um, I guess like occasionally people will get thrown by that and they're like, wait, is the electron going positive charge here? Um, it is not, it's, this is just sort of looking at like a three dimensional equation that describes sort of its likelihood of being in space. Um, Another thing that I'm kind of glossing over here is if this describes the likelihood the electron is going to be there, how the heck can we get a negative value that's like a negative probability? Um, it turns out that really the wave function that underlies this can be positive or negative, but then if you want to get the actual probability, of electron being at that point,
is actually the square of the value of the wave function. So it's always going to be positive. All right, so we're not going to get into that. But just in case you're wondering, like, that's kind of how we get around that. So it's always positive. Okay. So, but we do have a wave value that has two different options for its sign. Um, so that's actually why we're using shading over there. So we can use light or dark if we're on the chalkboard and only have one color option. Um, in the book, more frequently, it's going to be shown as red or blue. So, for example, if I redraw one of my p orbitals here, this is why one of the, the parts of the thing, one of the halves of it was shaded in. Um, so we can also use like shaded and unshaded on the chalkboard, for example, but maybe arbitrarily I'm going to use shaded to say like that's a negative value. And maybe this unshaded would be a positive value. Or the other way around, it's totally arbitrary, just so long as we know that they're opposite signs from each other. OK. So um, the actual sign of them is not too important, whether it's negative or positive. Um, what does turn out to be surprisingly important is the location of the nodes, like where the thing goes through zero value question. Um, so it's actually, um, I'm actually not entirely sure if it has units, but I might have to get back to you about that. It's been a little while since I dug down to that level of theory, actually. Sorry. Yeah. Um, other question. Mm -hmm. Does the S orbital not have any positive or negative charge in um, Well, so the charge is, I guess, like, we're looking more at, like, the value of a function. Um, but the S orbital turns out to be more complicated. Um, we're actually just about to get into that when we start looking at nodes. So yeah, I'll show sort of a couple of examples there. OK. So um, what we're looking at is nodes. And just like they did on our one-dimensional string up there, um, We'll notice, or you'll notice that every time we go from a crest or a positive value to a trough or a negative value, you have to pass through zero to get there. So nodes are going to exist every place where you switch from positive to negative values, or in other words, everywhere you switch from dark to light when you're moving around in the orbital. or light to dark, or vice versa. So basically, everywhere you switch colors, you're like traveling around in space near the orbital. OK. So what this means is that, again, with our p orbital up here, if we imagine like a tiny little point in space that we're looking at, and we start out here in the shaded orbital, and we move over here to the unshaded orbital, we're switching to a different colored region of the orbital. So we're switching from negative to positive, or vice versa. So as we do that, we're crossing over this node, this place where there's a zero value of the wave function. So nodes have zero value. And since the probability of the electron being there is that value squared, that tells us that nodes have zero likelihood of the electron being located there.
Okay. So it turns out we can actually calculate how many and what type of nodes um, based on the quantum numbers for that orbital. So each orbital has a total of n minus 1 nodes, of which L are planar, so like flat plane shaped nodes, kind of like this one I showed up here, it's like sort of a flat slice across the orbital. And the rest are going to be spherical, which means that n minus 1 minus L are spherical. Okay, so Let's look at some of those. Um, actually, I can draw them in down here. Okay, so our 1s orbital has n minus 1 nodes, which is going to be 0. So it's got 0 nodes, of which 0 are planar and 0 are spherical. Not a whole lot of interest there. It's just all the one color. And you can show that either like all shaded or all unshaded. Doesn't matter too much. Um, did I see a hand go up? Yeah. Um, so again, I guess like this is kind of the limitation of us like wanting to think of the electron as a particle. Um, but it's pretty much just at this scale a wave that could have like sort of like two peaks, one on either side of that node. And, so I guess like quantum tunneling is kind of the way to think about that is just the electron can be on one side or it can be on the other, but it's never going to exist like in the middle at any point. Yep. Okay. Um, so 1s, pretty simple, not a lot going on there. Let's look at 2s though. Because we know that 2s, for one thing it's bigger than 1s. So I'm going to draw it bigger down here. Um, it has a total of one node. Um, how many planar nodes does it have? Zero, right, because its L value is zero. That's why it's an S. Zero planar, and that means we got one spherical. Okay. So the way this thing is actually going to be set up, there's the nucleus right in the middle. This is like a giant sphere around the nucleus. But it turns out in the middle here, um, I'm going to draw it as a dotted line actually. But there's this spherical node that's sort of like two shells, one wrapped around the other, where like one half of the shell or like one layer of the shell is shaded. I'm going to show it as the outside one because I think that's how I have it in the notes. But you could just arbitrarily pick either side to be shaded. And then at some point, say you're like in a teeny tiny little spaceship here and you're sitting in this part of the orbital and then you fly through space to the inner part of the shell, at some point you're going to be crossing through a spherical node that's sort of like a gap in between the two shells. Um, I saw a hand go up a little while ago. Okay, cool. Okay, um, so other questions about that? Okay, so sort of think of it as like two kind of balls like one wrapped around the other or like two layered nested balls. Uh-huh. So if we took a 3S orbital, that mm. would be two like three layers. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like one of those matryoshka dolls where it's like one around the other around the other. So um, this is not in the notes, but yeah, let me draw that up just for an example. So 3S has um, two nodes which is going to be zero planar again and two spherical. I'm going to swap chalk real quick. Okay, so here we have two different places where you flip sign as you travel inwards or outwards. And so I'm just going to arbitrarily pick maybe like, let's make the middle layer be shaded and the other two be unshaded. But I could have just as easily have done it the other way around. Okay. 
Cool. So that's S. Um, let's do some P examples. Um, I sort of didn't leave myself a lot of room here. All right. I'm going to crunch this up a little bit. Okay. There we go. All right. So 2P orbital. Let's just check that we're drawing that the right way up there. All right, so 2p, we have how many total nodes? One again, right? Same as 2s. So one node of which one is planar and zero are spherical. OK, so 2p is pretty much exactly what we showed up here. It's just got the one flat plane of a node that slices across the middle of the whole thing. And on one side, it's going to be shaded. And on the other side, it's going to be not shaded. So again, if you imagine you're in like some tiny spaceship that's smaller than an atom, and you're flying from here over to here, at some point, you cross through a region of zero electron density. OK, how about 3p? So again, it's still a p orbital. It's still kind of dumbbell shaped. It's got two total nodes, of which one is planar and one is spherical. OK, so this one, it's got the same like dividing planar line down the middle again. But it also has a spherical thing going on around the nucleus. So this one is kind of hard to draw. I have like my best effort in the notes, but um, <laughs> you doing it in ChemDraw is kind of tricky. But it's pretty much going to be something like this, where, again, every place you cross a node, you need to flip colors of the orbital. So here we start out, let's say, unshaded. We go to shaded. And then we cross over again to unshaded, and then we're shaded out here at the end. OK, so it's going to look kind of like that. OK, so a lot of this is not super duper necessary to know when we're looking at the chemistry that's based on it. Like, at least the number of internal nodes is not um, necessarily going to be as useful, but knowing the overall shape of the orbitals and how many of them there can be is actually crucial for figuring out a lot of reactions um, and why they work the way they do. OK, so if you guys want to take a minute, I'm going to erase the other half of the board again, and then we can look at how to use these.
So once we've got the orbital determined by the three principal, uh, by the three quantum numbers, um, then the next step is actually starting to plug electrons into them based on how many we have in the atom. So the orbitals exist whether there's stuff in them or not. They're just solutions to some hypothetical mathematical function. Um, but until we start actually filling them with electrons, they're just kind of sitting empty and are not super relevant to what we're doing a lot of the time, although sometimes they are. Um, so electrons, as it turns out, have a fourth quantum number. And possible values for that are only two, either plus a half. Um, oh, so the name of it is uh, spin, which is m sub s. And so this can only be either plus a half or minus a half. OK, so we can start filling electrons into the molecule. But the caveat is that no two electrons on the same atom can have all four numbers the same. So this is the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, so we're going to start filling it in from um, the lowest energy to the highest energy. Um, did I see a hand go up? No? Okay, cool. Okay, so we're going to fill them in using the Aufbau principle. Which I think is German for just like building upwards. So start at lowest energy and go upwards. Okay, and then one other rule that turns out to be followed that we need to know about um, is Hund's rule. If you've got multiple options at the same energy, put one electron in each and then come back and fill in a second. Okay, so we'll look at an example that makes that make sense. going to show this is we're going to draw the orbitals for a given atom. Let's do carbon, which has a total of six electrons. So we're going to draw an energy scale on this side. We know that energy is mostly set by the n value. So all of our one orbitals are going to be down here. Um, but it turns out that energy is also, to a lesser extent, determined by the L value. So it turns out that 1s, which is the only possible one orbital, is down here at the bottom energy-wise. 2s is well above that. And then 2p is up here. So we know that we only have one possible 1s orbital. That's the one sphere that I showed over here. Um, we know that 2s, we only have one possible value. But 2p, we know that we have three different options there for 2p orbitals. Those are the like x or y or z axis ones. So we're going to show three different sort of platforms for the electrons to be in, three different 
orbitals for them to fill. Um, if we kept going, we could show 3s and 3p, but we're going to run out of electrons before we get there. Okay, so um, we know that because the Pauli exclusion principle says we can only have one electron of a given set of four numbers, that basically means that, say for 1s, it's set at n equals 1, l equals 0, and m sub l equals 0. So we've still got two options for the fourth number for an electron. They can either be plus a half, which we're going to show as an upwards arrow, or it can be minus a half, which we're going to show as a downwards arrow. Again, it doesn't really matter too much which one you fill in first. It's a little bit arbitrary, just so long as they're in the orbital at opposite orientations to each other. Okay, so we're plugging two electrons into this orbital, so that empty spherical kind of shell around the atom is now carrying the two electrons maximum that it's allowed to hold. And we're plugging them in there first because it's lower in energy, and we're going to build up from there. Okay. So 2s, we're going to do the same thing, an up electron or plus a half, and a down electron, or minus a half. Um, okay, so that's one, two, three, four electrons that we've plugged into these orbitals. We've got six total to spend, so we're going to plug them in here. And this is where Hund's rule starts to matter, because we're going to plug one electron into each of these orbitals, and then if we still have enough left over, we're going to come back and do the second one. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and we're out of electrons on carbon. That's all we got to play with. Okay. So we're going to describe this sort of pattern of filling in electrons into different energy shells. Sorry, I'll get to you in just a second. As um, the name of each orbital in parentheses followed by how many electrons it's got. So this one we can call 1s2 because there's two electrons in it. And then 2s2. 2, again, because there's two electrons in it, and then 2p2. And if you wanted to be more specific, you could break this down into like 2px, 2py, 2pz, um, but most of the time we're not going to bother doing that. Um, does that answer? Uh, so my question was, uh, do you always fill up the s orbital then, or the s shell? Um, yes, if it's got any electrons at all, pretty much, like this is going to be the first to fill. Um, but if we're looking at something with only like one or zero electrons, for instance, like hydrogen or hydrogen with a plus charge, then this one might not even get filled. So you like build them on levels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're always building upwards. Okay, so that's going to be a good stopping place for today. I'm going to have to wrap this chapter up on Monday, so I'm going to bump for the due date for chapter one sapling a bit. Mm-hmm.